Good evening. Welcome to worship this evening. We welcome all the guests and visitors that we have with us. We're glad you're here this evening. We also welcome all those who are worshiping with us online, on TV, and the radio. For those worshiping with us on the radio, I, Pastor Nick Quinette, will be conducting the service, and Pastor Tim Miller will be preaching this evening, and Mrs. Bethany Babinuk is our organist. The theme of today's service is Jesus Appears as the Lamb of God. I, take, I ask you all after the service to take these truths and all these wonderful blessings we hear from God's Word and apply it to your lives. Please note that this service will be shortened a little bit. We have a um, special update on the stained glass window renovation that will come at the end of the service. We continue with the opening hymn, hymn number 380, Jesus Shall Reign Where the Sun. of service is a shortened version of the service setting one in the blue hymnal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us. 
according to your promises in Christ Jesus. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your one and only Son to be the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by the, your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and believed to all the ends of the earth. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. We remain standing for the gospel lesson. Our gospel lesson comes from John chapter 1. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I was talking about when I said, The one coming after me outranks me because he existed before me. I myself did not know who he was, but I came baptized with water so that he would be revealed to Israel. John also testified, I saw the Spirit descend like a dove from heaven and remain on him. I myself did not recognize him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, The one on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this myself, and I have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day John was standing there again with two of his disciples. When John saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned around and saw them following him, he asked, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He told them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. They stayed with him that day. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his own brother, Simon, and say to him, We have found the Messiah which is translated, the Christ. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. At this time, we ask everyone to fill out the attendance cards that can be found in the pew in front of you. Another option is to use the QR code found up on the screen and also in the bulletin. For those who are worshiping with us online, you can find a link above or below the video. Thank you for your cooperation. We continue with singing the hymn of the day, hymn number 525, The Lamb. Please note we will sing the two, first two verses, and then we will have a children's devotion in the middle. So at this, that second verse, the kids can start coming up, and we will continue after the children's devotion with completing the hymn.
And good evening to everyone. It's good to see everyone here at worship and this children's devotion, not only for these children, but also all of you as children of God. I'm going to show you a picture, and maybe you'll recognize it, maybe you won't, and if you recognize it, just uh, let me know, all right? And I'm going to bring it up, up on the big screen, too, so that the congregation can see it. All right. What do you think? Do you recognize it? Okay, you're pointing where? Yes? You are right. It's that stained glass window right over there. And you know that we're having a huge project done with our stained glass windows. They are being fixed up and refurbished so that they don't fall apart. It's taken quite a bit of time because it's such oh, detailed work. And later on at the end of the service, we're going to have our president of our congregation let us know as far as giving us an update on that. But let's get back to this picture, okay? We see in the picture some words. Agnus Dei. Agnus Dei. Those are Latin words. And they mean Lamb of God. Lamb of God. All right? There's a person in there. Who do you think that person is? Yes? Did you say Jesus? That's what we would all at first answer, but it's not, he's not Jesus. It's somebody else. Somebody who said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why we have Lamb of God here. And he's somebody who pointed to Christ as the Savior. That's why we have a cross there as well. Who do you think it is? John, which John, though? Yes, you are correct, John the Baptist. We were trying to figure it out. We thought maybe that could be John the Apostle until we saw what he was wearing. He's wearing, you remember what John the Baptist wore? Yep, camel's hair. That's right. And if you look at it when the sun is shining through, you'll be able to see that camel's hair. It's up there on the screen as well and right here before you. So, we have John, and he's pointing. He's pointing. Now, he's pointing up, but probably when he was pointing at Jesus, he was pointing at Jesus coming. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, pointing, when I was young, my dad and mom and my grandma and grandpa, they told me pointing is rude, pointing at people. Now, they weren't saying that all the time it's rude, but sometimes it's rude because when you're pointing at somebody, and maybe you're talking to somebody next to you, that person you're pointing at might think that you're talking and saying something badly about that person. So my parents would say, don't point at people. But this is good pointing. This is good pointing. This is what we want to do, too. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what John is doing here. Pointing up as we think about God in his heaven, right? On his throne, although he's with us every day. But look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What about this one? The next picture. Where is this one? Yes? It's on the other side. And who's that? I'm going to come over to you. Yes? Yes? That is Jesus. That's right. And where is Jesus? Yep. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. You are absolutely correct. What's he doing? He's praying. Do you know that he was praying so hard that his sweat was like drops of blood, the Bible says. He was in agony. There in the garden, he was carrying out his role as the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. We often think of Jesus on the cross as the Lamb of God, but really all the suffering he went through for us as our sins were on him, he was carrying out his role as the Lamb of God. And you know, I like to think of it when I think of our church and we got John the Baptist over there, we got Jesus over there. I like to think of how maybe, maybe the people who were there as the stained glass windows were being made and designed, maybe they were thinking John the Baptist, there, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Maybe. 
But I want you to listen carefully to the sermon because it's going to be all about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There is one more trivia question I have for you, and it's really for all of you. It's a tough one. It's a difficult one. It's one that I don't know the answer to. If any of you can figure it out, let me know sometime so that I know and we all know. And that is our church is named what? Yep. St. John's. Is that St. John's after John the Baptist or the Apostle John? Many would say it's got to be the Apostle John. But then we have the stained glass window. We'll just leave that open. Maybe somebody can check the history and find out which John is our church named after. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, thank you so much for sending your Son. Dear Son of God, thank you for coming into the flesh and as both true God and true man, carrying out that plan of salvation for us, being the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. Thank you. Help us to praise you and also to live for you every single day. Lead us to grow more and more in your word as we listen to your word here at church and also whenever we read it or hear it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you can go back to be with your families and let's sing the remaining verses of that song. of God who takes away the sin of the world. Your Christian friends, look, as you hear that command, it might be something urgent. You need to look right away. Or maybe it's not that big of a deal when somebody says, look, maybe we're talking about a sunset, a beautiful sunset, certainly it is a big deal. We think of God and his creation. But there will be a sunset again. And so it might be, oh, look, look at that beautiful sunset. Or look might be used in this way. Look out. Look out for that ball that's coming at you. Look out so it doesn't hit you in the head. Or the golf version of look out for... You know, when somebody hits a ball and it's going right towards someone, they call out, four, look out. I know what can happen there. I got one right in the side of the head once when I was on the golf course. And it really hurt. So look out can be an urgent thing. 
when we're talking about what we have before us, God's Word and what it says to us, we want to look. This is urgent. This is all important to look. And you might be thinking that I'm talking about looking at Jesus. And yes, I will be talking about that. But first of all, look at yourself. That's right. Look at yourself. Look, look within you. And be honest. Take a good look at yourself and what you are by nature and what you would be without Christ and what he's done for you. According to our sinful nature, we are sinful through and through. When we are born, we are dead in sin. We are enemies of God. We are ugly, dirty with sin, the Bible says. And, and you can admit that. We all need to admit that. If we don't admit that, then we're lying because we know that there is sin within us that comes out of us. Maybe when we hurt someone with our words or our actions. Maybe when we're holding a grudge. Maybe when we swear or curse, use God's name wrongly. You know that it's there. And we need to take a good look within ourselves and, and admit that ugliness and, and the regrets that we have because of sins that we have committed. That's what Paul did with these words. Romans chapter 7. I know that good does not live in me that is in my sinful flesh. The desire to do good is present with me, but I am not able to carry it out. So I fail to do the good I want to do. Instead, the evil I do not want to do, that is what I keep doing. He's talking about his sinful nature. And it doesn't want to do good. He says, oh, he wants to, but then he doesn't. You know that $900 billion are spent every single year on beauty products. People who are trying, we're included, trying to make ourselves beautiful on the outside. But all those dollars, are they going to help us as far as what's in the inside? What's there, what lies within us all? that dirty sin, that ugliness that we all have. And, and if you don't admit it, then you're really lying to yourself and, and you're also lying to God. Maybe when we are tempted not to admit it, we might be thinking that we're pretty good compared to other people. Or we're pretty good because we do a lot of great and wonderful things compared to other people. Or we really try hard, but we're fooling ourselves. Because all of us, on our own, without Christ, according to our sinful nature, are ugly inside. We have that sinfulness through and through. And so we look at ourselves. It's important to do. Jesus tells us that. He says, but whatever comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. That is what defiles a person. To be sure, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual sins, thefts, false testimonies, and blasphemies. And Paul put it simply this way, there is no one who does what is good, there is not even one. This is according to our sinful nature. Without Christ, we can't do anything good in God's eyes without Christ. What does God see then when he looks at us? Again, without Christ. He sees sin. Because he can see it all. He can see our thoughts. He can see our actions. And he can see and hear what's coming out of us. And he sees people who are following after the treasures and the pleasures of the world. He sees men and women and boys and girls who are thinking and doing and saying things that are contrary to his word. He sees how people are hurting each other and holding grudges against each other. He, he sees all of that. But then John says, having looked at yourselves, then John says, look, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Oh, isn't the gospel so sweet? 
when you've taken a good look at yourself, who you are without Christ? It is just so sweet because it means total and complete forgiveness. We're talking about the Lord God here taking on human flesh and doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, living perfectly. We, we have the perfect, beautiful Son of God, the Savior, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And John identifies him for us as true God in human flesh. Where does John say that? Look. Look. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's only one that can take away the sin of the world, and that is God himself. That's the Savior. John says in our text, and we heard it before, this is the one I was talking about when I said, the one coming after me outranks me because he existed before me. Sounds like a puzzle, a riddle, but actually when you think of Jesus as both true God, true man, it, it fits perfectly. As far as his human nature, he was born after John, but as far as his divinity, he is from eternity before John and beyond. This is true God, the Lamb of God. But he took on our ugliness, our sin. And then how did he look? To the world. You know, when, G when John said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and people looked at Jesus, they didn't see someone out of the ordinary. Jesus was true man, yet without any sin. No sin. But he didn't look out of the ordinary. In, in fact, as he took our sins upon him, that disfigured him. People were repulsed by him. It says here in the word, he was despised and rejected by men. A man who knew grief, who was well acquainted with suffering, like someone whom people cannot bear to look at. He took our ugliness upon himself and he went to the cross and paid for it all. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When you hear that Title, Lamb of God, what do you think of? A Jew would immediately think of the Old Testament sacrificial system. Lambs were used all the time. And they were sacrificed, blood shed. They didn't take away sin in and of themselves, but because they pointed ahead to the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. That one who would come who would do it once for all. But those lambs were sacrificed again and again. You might also be thinking about the Passover lamb. Remember where that came from? The people, the children of Israel, were in Egypt in slavery. And God sent Moses to bring them out. And God brought upon the Egyptians the ten plagues. Finally, after that tenth plague, the Pharaoh said, take, take your people and go. Remember that tenth plague? What did God tell the people to do? He said, take a lamb, slaughter it, take the blood, and paint your doorposts with the blood. And believe me when I say this, God says that as you do that, I'm making the promise that you will be saved. And I will pass over, pass over your home, and you will be fine. And that's what happened. And then they came out from their slavery and they were led to the promised land. Now think about the similarities. The blood of the lamb. The lamb was slaughtered. Jesus slaughtered on the cross. His blood shed, painting the, door, painting the posts of the cross. Paying for all sins once for all. Taking us out of the slavery of our sin. Slavery to the devil. Slavery to death and and taking us on the journey to heaven, to that promised land. Jesus, the spotless, it had to be a spotless lamb, unblemished, because you see it represented Christ. When he came, he was spotless, he was holy, he was without blemish. And he died for every single one of your sins and your sinfulness. Like a lamb, it says, in the scriptures, he was led to the slaughter. 
And like a sheep that is silent in front of its shearers, he did not open his mouth. And again it says, he was crushed for the guilt our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. That's the Lamb of God. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John pointed Jesus out as the Lamb of God to the people there, to you today, to also Andrew. It brings up Andrew. After Andrew spent a day with Jesus, we're told the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and say to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. He brought him, Simon Peter, to Jesus. Look, he said, the Lamb of God. That's what we want to do. We want to see people the way God sees them. And how does he see them? He sees them as souls that are lost, souls that are confused, souls that are dirty with sin and need Christ, the beauty and the righteousness of the Savior. They need the Lamb of God. Many are lost in their own guilt and their own shame and don't know where to turn. But what can we do? We can do what John did. What is that? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So look, look, it's urgent. Don't just take a quick look. Nope. Don't look with your peripheral vision. Nope. Look, look with your whole heart. Believe what God says when he says, look, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we give our offerings to the Lord, we're going to be singing this song, hymn number 403 in the blue hymnal. It's a new song. You'll see how it fits with the Lamb of God. And we have a recording by our junior choir from our school. And so the recording is going to play. They're going to be singing the hymn. And you can jump in as soon as you feel comfortable. Most of us will be jumping in after. They'll sing the refrain first, then verse 1. And then we'll sing the refrain, all of us together, in verse 2, and then the refrain. And as the offering baskets are brought forward, after they have been passed around, then we dedicate all our offerings to the Lord, those given here, those given online, and those dropped off. And we give because of the Lamb of God who has taken away our sin. Let's sing hymn number 403 with the junior choir.
our prayers this evening. We include a prayer of thanksgiving for Val Schienemann, who was kept safe through a surgery, and also for, for uh, Rick Ebert, who was hospitalized this last week but is now out of the hospital and recovering. And for our teacher, Steve Thies, who has been called to serve as a fifth grade teacher and athletic director at David Starr Lutheran Church and School in Jackson, Wisconsin. We will remain seated for the prayer of the church and the intercessory prayers, but stand for the Lord's Prayer. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have set him from your side. You walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the holy Lamb of God. O wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost I should have died, but you have brought me to your side. To be led by your staff and rod, and to be called a Lamb of God. Amen. And your physician of both body and soul, we give you thanks for watching over Val through her surgery and Rick through his time in the hospital. We ask you to keep their faith strong as they continue to recover. And if it is your will, help them to make a full recovery so that they may be, may be back to normal soon. And Lord of the Church, we ask you to be with Steve Thies as he has been called to serve at David Starr and Jackson. Guide him to make the decision that best serves you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. may be seated. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper and members of our church and church body come to Holy Communion, approach up the middle aisle and return by the side aisle. When indicated, kneel or remain standing at the rail. Receive the wafer with an open hand and take the wine cup yourself from the tray. If you prefer to be handed the wine cup, simply hold out your hand. Hold your wafer hand up like stop if you'd like a gluten-free wafer available on a sleeve on the, tr on the tray. Um, alcoholic white wine is also, also available in the middle of the cup tray. Cup receptacles are along the walls. The common wine cup or chalice is provided as a choice. A general blessing will be given at the close of Holy Communion. Please come for all things are now ready.
please stand. The true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for the closing hymn. evening. It's great to have you all in worship this evening. A few announcements. Uh, tomorrow between the services we'll be having our uh, typical Bible studies, um, youth league down in the council chambers, uh, Bible, adult Bible study across the street in the um, school cafeteria and Sunday school downstairs in the basement. We'll also be having a call meeting right after the first service. We will meet here in church, and then after that's done, um, we're only calling for one position, uh, ECM director. Um, we'll go to the various Bible classes then thereafter. Wednesday morning Bible class continues at 10 a.m., going through the 10 lies about God. Christian Company will be Sunday, January 22nd at noon. Please RSVP to Dan um, Seelman. Thank you. There's just the first name on here. Dan Seelman or the, uh, the church office. Um, live streamers are still needed. You can find more information in the bulletin there. Um, please also note um, there will be a VBS volunteer meeting after the later service on February 5th um, then. So after the late service, um, this is kind of our initial meeting. Uh, we moved VBS this year up a month, so it's going to be in June. So we're starting to go through the planning process a little bit earlier. It shouldn't be a long meeting. And also there will be a welcome committee meeting Tuesday, the 31st at 5.30 in the council chamber. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, help welcoming the new members in, uh, you're welcome to come then as well. If you want to find more information on what it's about, please talk to myself. We also have the letter from uh, Steve Thies um, for the congregation as he was, has received a call. He says, Dear family, fellow believers in Christ, last Sunday, January 8th, I was humbled to receive a call to serve as the fifth grade teacher and athletic director at David Starr Lutheran Church and School in Jackson, Wisconsin. I ask you to keep Ann and I in your thoughts and prayers while we prayerfully consider the two calls that have been placed before us. It is with humility and awe that we have the opportunity to deliberate where the Lord can best use the gifts and talents that he has given to us so that we may better serve him and his kingdom here on earth. Anne and I will keep both the congregations in our thoughts and prayers while we diligently consider where God can best use us for the betterment of his kingdom. It is only by God's grace that we are given the privilege and ability to teach and preach his word to the children entrusted to us. As it is stated in Proverbs 22.6, dedicate a child to the way he should go, and even when he becomes old, he will not turn away from it. Your servant in Christ, Steve Thies. Certainly keep him and Anne in your prayers as, they are as he is deliberating these call this call over the next few weeks. Those are all our announcements for the evening. We have our church president, Lauren Lang, um, to give us an update on the stained glass window project. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to walk down here so that I can see what you can see. All right. 
Yeah. So, a lot of questions been asked about the stained glass window and, you know, where we started to where we are now. It really doesn't seem like there's much difference at all. You look at them, they kind of look the same. But it's a lot of work, and some of that work is very unexpected. And in truth, there's only one small window that's done, the one in the south tower back here on the south side at the bottom. If you look at that one from the outside, you'll see what they're all going to look like. It's very difficult to see that progress until we can see it from outside, like tonight, for instance, with the light shining through. But we're going to begin to see those results very soon. There have been a lot of questions, as I said. The number one question, why is it taking so long? Well, the five windows that you see on the south side and the three windows on the west side are actually 59 individual windows. And some of those windows contain more than 300 individual pieces of stained glass. Not, not in total. One individual window contains more than 300 pieces. Some of the leading in that is 167 years old. And you don't clean that with Windex and a soft cloth. Okay? You clean it with wire brushes and acid. The stained glass itself is between 112 and 167 years old. It's an involved process. They have to sand, they have to paint, they have to repair the mounting area of the building interior itself before they're putting, put them in. Every single frame has to be altered, routed out in order to accept the new style of storm windows that will be put in there. And all of that has to be done while we allow for worship, regular worship, and special services, funerals, weddings, things like that. Each piece has to be identified so that it goes back where it was. You know, I had 17 windows replaced in my house a couple of years ago. A crew of four guys came in, and in six hours, they had it done. This is a little bit different, okay? Each piece has to be identified so it gets back, and then each piece has to be cleaned. All of that black stuff you see on the, with the pliers there, that's all that lead that has to be cut away, ground away without altering or breaking the glass. And then there's the surprises. The 167-year-old windows, this one and this one, they extend down into the walls. In the 1970s, when the sanctuary was made to look like this instead of the way it looked before that, the decision was made that those windows would stop there, but they actually go down into that wall. There's more stained glass down in there. That was a surprise. There's wooden frames that are in much rougher shape than what we thought they were, okay? Keep in mind that when the bidding was done on the job, we could only look from in here because we can't take that covering off the outside until it's time to take the covering off the outside. So there's some, prize, some surprises on the, the wood frames there. Then we had the, the pandemic. Of course, we contracted originally in November of 2019 with a 24-month estimate for completion, and then COVID hit, okay? And uh, there was also a very significant personal health issue of the, the primary man doing the work. And then, of course, there's the Wisconsin weather. It's very involved. That's a jig fixture that had to be made in order to recreate some of the wooden trim that you see inside here. Next question, why is it blue? People uh, who are in here in the, in the daytime notice that some glass up in this area up here seems blue and the rest of it seems green. It doesn't show like that tonight, and that's a good thing. But the fact of the matter is the glass is 112 years old. There's no true replacement. It has to be of uniform thickness. And elsewhere in that, win that entire ensemble window, there's plenty of green. So we, they got as close as they could to match it. Um, before the project started, few of us noticed how many pieces of that glass were broken 
were completely missing. We didn't even notice. So why are they crooked? This is the next question. In these bottom two windows, the lower left and the lower right, during the daylight, you would see where I have the red arrow pointing there, you'll see that it shows light on the outside edge. That's not a mistake. That's not uh, poor workmanship. These windows were altered at some point to be opened. If you look at the ones on this side compared to the ones on that side, you'll see the opening windows are still on the bottom over there. They're not over here. That's why we had to replace the wood. If you look at those two red arrows, you'll see in the photograph before the work began, the wood trim is actually no longer there. That's all new pieces there, okay? And in order to do that, back when they remodeled and made those windows so that they would open, actually took the glass, that is that window right there at the shop, and you'll see that the lower section where that opening window was, the glass is actually narrower. The whole window is narrower. The glass was cut away at that time. We cannot uh, make it magically reappear, so the window is put in that way. But not to worry, that white lines on the outside, that's not going to be the final appearance. There will be a covering installed on the outside that will stop the light from coming through at those outside edges and give them a much nicer appearance. Okay, it's part of the exterior storm windows is how they'll do that. And uh, again, there's more work been done on this than what we think. There's some of those storm windows in that metal uh, shed that's sitting in our parking lot. They've already been made. So when will it be done? The main south, this entire side here, these will be put in by about mid-February. And then, or the main south, the big one here, it's done. The storms are out there. It just needs to be installed. The storms need to be installed. Okay? The south entryway, this one, will be reinstalled mid-February. The very top pieces, those are already done up on top. And uh, the southwest balcony, I'll call that that back window right back there, that extends both above and below the balcony, okay? That one's in progress, but it was halted in order to address the main west side, okay? The main west side is that all of that is supposed to be reinstalled prior to the organ repair in late January, pending when we can get the organ repair and the stained glass window people together on that. I believe that uh, two sections, the outer two, were installed today. I know they delivered them yesterday, so I believe that, yeah, it looks like they were put in there today. Um, the southwest balcony, it's, that's this one again. Interesting thing about that is that there's no way to remove that window from the inside. All the rest of these, you know, we had the scaffolding in here for a couple of years, and they pulled them out from the inside. They can't do that with that one, so they have to wait until they have the, the lift here in order to take those out from the outside because of the balcony being there. So the plan for the spring is that a lift will be brought to the site and the old yellowed exterior coverings over all the south and west will be removed. Then the necessary sanding and painting of the exterior superstructure, that's the, the, the window jam, okay? The part that doesn't move when you take the window out. And the storms will be installed on the main south, south entrance, and hopefully the main west, the tall one above the organ. And the south balcony, south tower, and north tower windows will be removed from the outside to be worked on. And how long will that take? Well, that depends on the surprises we find there, and there will be some. And when those windows are complete, then the lift gets brought back to finish them. What about the north side? Well, that's a whole nother 35 windows. And one of which of them extends down into the wall again. The north side has not been approved by the voters. So it'll have to go there first before a contract is even signed. And that's not likely to happen until the funds are available. Where are we on finances? The original quote for the south side was 198.3 plus a 20% contingency. 
we will likely consume that contingency. Paid to date, $155,300, remaining invoice, $43,000 of the, the quote amount plus up to a $40,000 contingency. The original quote for the west side was $109,000, again with the contingency. We've paid $72,400 so far for that. The remaining $36,000 plus $22,000 contingency. So in short, there's going to be a balance due between $79,600 and $142,000. As of December 31st, there's $67,500 in the stained glass window fund. So we are going to need additional funds of somewhere between twelve dollars and $72,000 before completion of the work on these two sides. That's not going to happen next week, by the way. It's going to take some time yet. We have to be patient. The north side, just, just so that you know, is going to be an additional two hundred dollars to $240,000 over the course of one to two years when it is decided to do it. So, I've recently, uh, as beginning of December, started to inject myself into this whole project, and I've kind of made myself the contact, the go-between between our congregation and the stained glass window people. Anyone who has questions about comments, whatever, you're welcome to contact me directly. I'm on Realm, there's my phone number, I've got an email address. Call me anytime, I'm happy to talk about it. I got a couple other things I want to touch on. Uh, sharing our house of prayer update. You can see the numbers there. Pledged and already given, 265,000. 71,000 from, given from those who did not pledge. And then an additional 90, almost 93,000 from those who pledged over and above their pledge amount. So a total to the building fund of 429,600 since January of 2021. Our building fund balance as of the end of last year was 571,800. There's 115,400 remaining pled on pledges. 687,200 plus necessary unpledged gifts before we can address the HVAC system at the school, for which we will be seeking bids for that job soon. There will also be some very significant options to consider as to how we go forward with that. Of course, we've already paid for engineering work to be drawn up for, for one of those plans, but there is an option to do it a different way, um, which costs less short-term, costs a lot more long-term. Um, but we'll, we'll bring those options to the voters. And we will keep you informed as to when those decisions will be made so that uh, everyone can come. Obviously, everyone's invited to a voters' meeting, so... And then the last thing I want to talk about is a fellowship opportunity we have coming up. Most of you know I'm pioneer leader now for almost 30 years. And we have our Pine Car Derby. And this year we are going to do our St. John's Derby with the boy pioneers and the girl pioneers. Instead of on a Tuesday night, we're going to do it on a Sunday afternoon. And we're going to invite any one of you, young, old, everyone. You want to make a car, race a car, please do. Join us. Come have some fun with us. Check-in will be from 12.30 to 1.45 in the gym with racing beginning at 2 on February 26th. And you can get your car kits directly from me or Cindy's got them in the church office. Kids who are in Pioneers have already paid for theirs. They can pick them up there if they want or join us on the next two Tuesday nights for, we have our, our cutting nights for, for Pioneers. But anyone not in Pioneers, young, old, whatever, can pick them up in the church office. They're $5 each, okay? And we'd love to have you join us. And with that, I will uh, stick around here. If anyone's got questions on the windows or pine car or anything, I'll be here for a while. Thank you.